Okay, Peggy is here. I was trying to get in. I was having trouble. Um, Madam Chair, you're muted. I'm so sorry. <laughs> was having a hard time getting in and now, thank you. It being 6.30 p.m. on December 21st, uh, 6.40 p.m. on December 21st, 2022, I call the meeting of the Brockton Conservation Commission to order. This meeting is being conducted remotely in accordance with the extension of the governor's order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, Mass General Law, Chapter 38, Section 20. Real-time public participation and comment can be addressed to the Conservation Commission utilizing Zoom, if you wish to comment during a public input portion of the hearing, use the raise your hand function to be addressed at the appropriate time. If you're joining by phone only, please press star nine to raise your hand. A copy of this recording will be posted on the city's web pages. All votes will be done via roll call to ensure count accuracy. Please note that discussion of all agenda items shall be limited to 15 minutes each to ensure timely progress throughout tonight's agenda. So we will begin with roll call attendance. Um, if each commissioner could please announce first and last name that you are here in order um, that we'd be able to establish quorum. Laura Beekler, aye. Ruby Clay, aye. Peggy Curtis, aye. Joyce Voris, aye. So all members are present and quorum is established. Um, the first uh, item on the agenda would be uh, acceptance of meeting minutes from October 19th. Has everyone had a chance to review those minutes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. I did note that there were just a few edits to be made. Um, on page one, my name needs an S in a couple of places at the end. Um, on page five, uh, Beta's agent name needs to be uh, changed to Gary James, as opposed to James Gary. And um, on, also on page five, Dr. Mobile's statement refers to groundwater mounding. So just that correction of the word mounding would be appropriate. And with those few changes, um, I would entertain a motion to accept the minutes. I make a motion to accept the minutes from October 19th. I second. Motion's been made and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Beekler, aye. Clay, aye. Curtis, aye. Voris, aye. The minutes have been accepted. Thank you. Um, the first item on the agenda, um, Dr. Shave, is it okay if I just go to that emergency certification right away? Uh, yes, if you want to introduce, yes, the extra item. Okay, there was one extra item that was not on the posted agenda, and that is an emergency certification for the Fuller Crafty Museum. So if Dr. Shave could explain, that would be yes. appreciated. So briefly, as you may remember, the Fuller Craft Museum has an order of conditions for work on their parking lot, including uh, new drainage work. Um, they are mostly done with that work. However, they are currently experiencing uh, flooding problems in their driveway. So they are proposing to do additional uh, drainage work essentially in the upland area between the isolated vegetated wetland and the bordering vegetated wetland. There's an area of upland that looks like it's probably been filled in and has been used for um, landscaping debris over the years and so on. So they're looking to remove that. And their concern was that the flooding is causing a slip and fall hazard in the winter due to it icing over overnight. So they requested an emergency certification to begin doing that grading work now and then applying for an amended order of conditions a request um, that would be submitted ahead of our January meeting. So on behalf of the commission, I granted them that emergency certification with several stipulations, including that 
they will file the request for an amended order with a plan showing this additional drainage grading work um, for our January meeting. Okay, we appreciate that information. There's no vote or anything that's required, correct? No, as an emergency okay. certification, I issued it as the agent. So if the commission has no additional um, requirements to make it this time, um, you don't need to do any additional action. Commissioners, do you have any, any comments at all that you'd like to make? No. Okay. No. What is our January meeting date? January 18th. 18th. Thank you. Good. Okay. Thank you. And now we can get on to the things on the posted agenda. Um, the first one is a request for a certificate of compliance for 93 Tilton Avenue. Okay. Is there a septic system installation? Is someone here from the applicant? Yes, I see Peter Lyons from Collins Engineering. Hi, good evening. Uh, can everyone hear me? Hi, Mr. Lyons, where are you? How are you? Um, yeah, I work with Collins Engineering. I'm representing the owner and applicant at this project uh, to answer any questions. Um, I don't know how you just want to proceed. Um, I do have a copy of the as built plan available to display if we want to discuss anything in particular. If you'd like to do a brief a brief um, overview, and, and uh, that would be nice to see that. Thank you. Sure. Um, can, can the commission see the plan on the screen? I can. All right. Um, again, for the record, Peter Lyons <clears throat> with Collins Civil Engineering Group, um, representing the owner, um, Mr. Gary Tremblay, at this property. Um, this site is um, a restoration on an existing home on Hilton Avenue. It's a lot set back between existing homes number 91 and 95. On the site, we have a, um, a stream that leads into a delineated pond. Um, the 50 and 100 foot buffers are shown on the plan, as well as the 200 foot buffer to the stream. Um, for this project, initially, um, we were um, basically seeking access to install a new septic system located in the rear of the property. Um, the septic has been since installed. There has been a lot of earthwork done on site, um, including the new septic system. Uh, we show 57 conservation markers that were installed approximately every 15 feet around the limit of work. Um, part of this project also <clears throat> consisted of the elimination of Japanese knotweed and some new planting areas to the east of the home, as well as um, this area to the south, if you can see me moving around. Mm -hmm. Um, we did have to encroach on the 25 foot buffer um, for the construction of the septic system that was defined as a temporary work limit, uh, which has since been overseeded um, with the specified mix from the Conservation Commission um, that was done kind of late in the year. So this area here is, I guess, considered stabilized. However, the desired um, plantings from the seeds have not popped yet, um, so this, it's stable. I guess the question is whether it meets the standards of the commission or not um, at this time. So again, all the, all the septic work has been done on this. I know um, there were some concerns with, with this disturbance area as well as the future um, monitoring. So I guess that's a quick overview. And, Maybe if Megan or anyone wants to take over from there, I can answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Schaaf. Could you um, give your report? Sure, so I went out to the site. I did confirm that the markers are in place in the correct location, including on the outside of the temporarily disturbed area within the 25 foot buffer zone. So the markers are going around that area 
um, to mark that that should not be a permanent area of disturbance. Um, it is stable, so there is currently grass cover um, in that area. And so to confirm the seeding that was used as part of my report, I requested that the applicant show what seeds were um, spread in that area. And they did provide the picture of the seed mix used, which was um, a wildflower mix. Um, so as Peter said, it looks like probably at this time of the year, the flowers aren't popping, but it does appear that that seed mix was used. So hopefully in the following year, uh, we will see that come back. And then similarly for the restoration area, um, the woody plantings are in and the area has been mulched um, for the winter. Again, um, confirming the seed mix, again, with the time of year, um, I couldn't see much in terms of it popping, but the applicant confirmed the mix they used there as well. And again, the woody plantings are in. Um, the Japanese knotweed was removed from that area. Um, however, I did see a few new canes popping up towards the northern limit of the restoration area. Um, so based on that, it looks like the applicant has met the requirements for the partial certificate of compliance, which included everything up through the initial planting and seeding and the installation of the markers. Um, in order to get a complete certificate of compliance, additional monitoring will be needed. Um, but based on what we have as of today, uh, the partial certificate of compliance would be appropriate with the continuing conditions D4, D7, F1, and F2. Uh, D4 and D7 refer to the special conditions related to the additional monitoring that will be needed before the complete certificate of compliance can be issued. And then F1 and F2 are the continuing conditions that refer to the markers and the prohibition of herbicides and pesticides on the site. And then finally, um, in addition to the partial certificate of compliance, I would recommend, as with some other recent COCs, uh, because of the potential reoccurring issue with the Japanese knotweed, I would recommend that the commission also issue a letter to the uh, upcoming new owner, letting them know the requirements to eventually receive a complete certificate of compliance and to potentially deal with the ongoing issue of the knotweed. Um, I would recommend that the commission ask the applicant to assist them in getting the information for any new owner so that that letter can be sent. Thank you. Dr. Shave, do you expect to put that in as a condition, as a special condition, that the um, commission be notified of the, um, the new owner of the property? Would that be one way to do it? Yes, if the commission would like to add that to the partial certificate of compliance, you could specify that the commission be informed of um, any change in ownership. It would be essentially a bolstering of what I believe is special condition A1, which is that the whenever the property is transferred, the owner is supposed to inform the new owner of the existence of the order of conditions. So essentially we would be continuing that condition with the addition that we would like to then be um, notified that that information has been provided. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lyons, any um, response to that? Um, no, I, I honestly, I'm not personally sure what the plan is for the property, if it's going to be resold. Um, I was under the impression our client was going to be here tonight, but I can definitely relay that information to them. Mm -hmm. I guess I've I've noted all of the commission's concerns, so we'll give them a recap on that. And, um, and just so I can confirm, we have a David with his hand raised. Um, Mr. Lyons, can you confirm is there a David associated with um, the owners? I'm, I am not sure on that. I'm potentially, okay. 
we have we have a Gary on yes. the application, so I don't know. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we weren't potentially if the owner was here, he could raise his hand, but I don't see him. Mr. Lyons, can you just indicate on the uh, uh, on the site plan where the knotweed removal was and that those woody plantings? Sure, I, I believe um, this area, the hatched area in here between the house and the existing driveways, um, basically all of this wooded area is, you know, invasive uh, knotweed. So we had proposed um, removal of a lot of it okay. in this hatched area. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioners, does anyone have any questions or comments? Just that I know the house is up for sale. I live one block away from it, so it's definitely up for sale. So we should probably put that in if that's something that we think is important. We'll put that in the order conditions. Okay. Anyone else, commissioners? No, no questions or comments from me. Okay. Um, I'll entertain a motion then to issue a par partial certificate of compliance with the continuing conditions and the addition of um, ownership identification for the knotweed removal. I make a motion to issue a partial certificate of compliance with the continuing conditions from the agent's report, which also includes um, notice to the of sale and the not weed removal maintenance. I second. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded for that partial certificate of compliance. Um, roll call vote, please. Speaker aye. Clay aye. Curtis aye. Boris aye. Motion is passed. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lyons. All right, thank you. Have, Have a, a lovely day. holiday. You as well. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is a request for an RDA, a request for determination of applicability for 1380 Main Street. Uh, is there a representative present from the, is it Hughes Environmental? Uh, yes, I see Tom Hughes. Hello, Mr. Hughes. Good evening. Uh, Tom Hughes with Hughes Environmental Consulting. Um, uh, here with me tonight, Steve Sawyer from GM2, who uh, prepared the plan, um, as well as we do have um, some folks, uh, Dan Danny uh, Garber Leticia and uh, Craig DeJong from the uh, architecture firm of Dietz and Company, as well as uh, Chris Berry from Brockton Housing. Um, however, I'll do the presentation and Steve's here if we have any engineering questions for him related to the plan and the other folks are just here if uh, anything comes up, but I think uh, I think we should be good. If it's all right with the commission, I'd like to share my screen. It certainly is. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Campello Apartments, uh, kind of sandwiched between Main Street and Plain. Um, it, uh, the location abuts uh, the Salisbury Plain River uh, at the confluence with French Brook. Um, so just for the record, there's the location. Um, so here's the site. You've got the Campello Apartments, you've got Salisbury Plain River, and French Brook comes out of a pipe kind of in roughly in this area and runs down uh, into the Salisbury Plain River. Um, the, uh, the site is mapped by FEMA as AE, and uh, there is an area of A with no determined elevation on the, uh, on the flood map. So here's a view of a fermet, and it shows you that you know, you've got upstream, you've got an elevation of 80, 79 uh, Plain Street kind of acts as a uh, as kind of a jam in the flood. You can see how it kind of spreads out when it reaches Plain and it comes out on the other side at 77. And then on the other side of our site, um, 
you know, our site is here, other side of our site, it drops down to 76. So um, what GM2, what Steve Sawyer has done is essentially use the distance between transects to calculate out the flood elevation. And then what we did for this area of A is we evaluated all the lomas that are on record for the upstream area to establish um, elevations. So you'll see in yellow on this submission, um, and I'm just gonna zoom in for a second. So you'll see, for example, at this location, it was just noted as it, the grade was 81.5 and it was determined out of flood. There was no elevation given, it was just somewhat less than 81.5. But in this location, it was determined to be 77.2 by the Loma. 77.2 over here, less than 82.5. So we went through that whole process um, through all of those Lomas. And essentially what, when you do that, we established that the elevation in the nearest upstream area of the floodplain was 77.2. We looked to make sure that the grades between this site, uh, or the Campella site and this area uh, were actually higher than that, which means that there's no overland flow. So it's essentially the piped uh, French brook. And so we essentially then did a gradient down to what the floodplain would be at the confluence, which is somewhat less than 76.9. I think it's like 76.6. Um, and so what we did is we came up with the floodplain on site being 77 and then dropping to 76.9. And we held 76.9 throughout the site. It's a little overly conservative, but it gives us a, a conservative way of determining BLSF. Um, so our RDA is seeking a positive 2B to uh, confirm that whole process I just went through. So on the floodplain, um, on the, the site plan we provided you, this line here is the graphic depiction of the AE and the A zone. Um, the what we did is we then took the 76.9, we drew it, and you can see these contours. It kind of wraps around this building. And then there's a point right here. If I zoom down, you can see there's an arrowhead. Right at that point is where the um, floodplain transitions to this short area of 77 at the entrance off Plain Street. Um, the floodway itself is as graphically depicted because that's the proper way for us to interpret the floodway. So. What we'd like to do is just lock in the, the BLSF elevations um, so we can then rely on those for doing some engineering work. There are other resource areas on site. We're not asking you to confirm those as part of this filing. Um, we're pretty confident there's not a lot of room for them to move based on the slopes and the, and the conditions on site. So we didn't feel that an ORAD would be necessary, which is what I would, you know, I would have filed an ANRAD if I needed to lock in the wetland lines, but an RDA is an appropriate tool in my mind for uh, for doing the floodplain. So happy to answer any questions. As I said, Steve's here too. If uh, you have any questions about how we did the the uh, the plan work there. Hey, thank you, Mr. Hughes. Um, Dr. Chafe, your impression? Yes. So having reviewed the RDA and the plan submitted, um, I would agree that this is a conservative estimate of the bordering land subject to flooding. If you compare the graphical um, determination of the floodplain based on FEMA to what's shown based on the calculated base flood elevation and the elevations on site, they're pretty close. Um, in some cases, in, tor in terms of the southwestern portion of the site, the um, floodplain as determined by the elevations a bit closer to the brook than the graphical depiction, but then as you move to the north, east of the site, the um, calculated floodplain is actually further out than the graphical depiction. You know, so overall, yeah, I would agree it is a conservative estimate and it is um, a fair estimate in terms of using existing elevations on the site. And again, the request is uh, just for the determination for bordering land subject to flooding. And so based on that, I think the commission can consider issuing the positive 2A 
determination for bordering land subject to flooding. And again, just to confirm a positive 2A is confirming that the boundary delineations described on the reference plans are confirmed as accurate. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions? Any questions at all? Peggy or Ruby? No questions for me. I don't have any questions at this time. Okay, thank you. I entertain a motion be made to issue a positive two way determination for bordering land subject to flooding for 1380 Main Street. I make a motion to issue at, I make a motion to issue a positive two way determination for bordering land subject to flooding at 1380 Main Street. Thank you. The motion has been made. Clay seconds the motion. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Speak aye. Clay aye. Curtis aye. Yvoris aye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great evening and a great Thank holiday. You. Take Thank care. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. The next item on the agenda is a notice of intent and an update on an enforcement order for 1330 Pleasant Street as a single family house. Um, is the applicant present? Azu? Yes, we have Azu and Taniro representing the applicant. Asu, do you have anything that you would like to present at this time? Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Uh, I believe uh, we were, we were waiting, um, uh, presented the project the last time. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was outstanding was that uh, Dr. Shave did not have uh, the time uh, based on the uh, uh, shortness of the uh, submittal to the office. Uh, she needed uh, time to uh, review our, our our modifications that I presented to the commission, as well as the um, invasive uh, species control. Uh, we did receive um, Dr. Shave's uh, report, uh, updated report, and uh, we are not we don't see any reason to be to be adverse to any of the comments or recommendations made in the report. We believe, we believe those are, are fair and uh, will ensure that the, if the commission were to issue the order, it would ensure that the project that were, can be properly you were constructed consistent with the order of conditions that the commission issues. And uh, the only thing I will add is that uh, Ken Thompson, um, with the recommendation relative to appointment of an environmental monitor, uh, Mr. Thompson, it's a, a very uh, uh, knowledgeable and has done numerous uh, projects of this nature that require the monitoring. And uh, we, as the engineers, uh, part of the uh, uh, contract that uh, we signed with the applicant is that we will uh, be engaged to uh, oversee the actual physical construction to make sure that we are not back before the commission asking mm -hmm. for forgiveness because uh, that's that's not that well how I, I roll. So, and uh, those are my comments, Madam Chair. Mm. Okay, thank you, Mr. Etonero. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Dr. Shaif, your report? Yes, so as was explained, we saw the revised plan at the last meeting um, on December 7th. In the meantime, I have reviewed that revised plan and it has addressed my previous comments and the comments brought up at the last meeting. So at this time, um, I would conclude that the commission can consider issuing an order of conditions 
with our standard special conditions. And also in my report, I am recommending additional special conditions. Um, there are 11 of them, so they are outlined in the report. Um, the reason for all of these additional um, special conditions, again, is because this is a post-enforcement order filing. Um, so amongst those 11 recommended additional special conditions are all in relation to monitoring and sequencing to make sure that we avoid any additional enforcement issues. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, does anyone have any questions? I believe it was December 13th that your, your report was issued, right? Yes, my revised report um, was issued December 13th prior, um, after our December 7th meeting. Mm -hmm. I don't have any questions at this time. Okay. I don't have any either, Peggy. Yep, same. I'm good. Okay, good. I do appreciate the sequencing that you did provide as well, Dr. Shea. That seems very um, helpful, I think. Um, okay. So, therefore, uh, let's see. Public comments. Is there anyone available or with their hand up that might want to speak about this particular site? Madam Chair, I don't see any hands raised for this hearing. Okay. Um, I entertain a motion to close the hearing. Make a motion to close the hearing for 1330 Pleasant Street. I second it. Motion has been made and seconded. Roll call vote, please. Beekler, aye. Clay, aye. Curtis, aye. Boris, aye. The motion, uh, motion's been closed. Uh, and I entertain a motion to issue an order of conditions with the special uh, conditions that are outlined in Dr. Shave's report. I make a motion to issue an order of conditions with special conditions outlined in the agent's report for 1330 Pleasant Street. I second. The motion has been made and seconded. Roll call vote, please. B. Claire, aye. Clay, aye. Curtis, aye. Boris, aye. Thank you. Yeah, Steve thank you. Zero, thank you for your help. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission, and Dr. Shiv, thank you all. And uh, Merry Christmas. And uh, a lovely, lovely Christmas. Have a Merry safe Christmas. one. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Okay, so that's number four. Um, next item on the agenda is enforcement order update and notice of intent for Claremont Avenue. Um, I believe this was the site near the sports complex, right? That was the enforcement order. Yes, this is specifically uh, parcel map 181-42 Claremont Ave. Okay. Um, is someone here from New Heights Builders or a representative for the client? Um, I see Kevin Grady of Grady Consulting. While I promote him, this is a new hearing, so I will confirm for the chair that MassDEP has issued their file number and we have received proof of mailing of the abutter notification. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, yeah. Mr. Kevin. Grady. Good evening. How's it going? Fine, thank you. Um, so for the record, Kevin Grady from Grady Consulting, representing the applicant for the uh, enforcement order and the notice of intent. Um, John Zimmer of South River Environmental uh, is also going to be joining us, but he has uh, another one of these scheduled at the same time. So, uh, Megan, if you see him pop on, uh, if you could please let him in, that would be great. Um, am I, let, I can share a screen now. Okay. Certainly. Um, you see the PDF plan in front of me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've been before the commission recently on this project for an RDA that was associated with the, the ball field, as you know, mm -hmm. so you're a little familiar with, with the site. We've been also talking about the enforcement order on, um, 
on processing and fill that's been uh, ongoing in the area adjacent to the bordering vegetative wetland, which you can see here on the west side of the property highlighted in blue. Um, the bordering vegetative wetland was delineated by John Zimmer, South River Environmental. Um, I believe he and Megan walked the line uh, recently. You can see there flag A1 is here and flag A56 uh, is located in this area um, from lot line to lot line. We're showing the uh, 25 foot buffer zone, the 50 foot buffer zone, and the 100 foot buffer zone um, associated with this bordering vegetative wetland. Um, as you know, the site uh, was filled over the last 15 years or so. Um, the commission issued an enforcement order um, to protect the resource area um, you know, a few months ago. We've been working with the town uh, various boards. We've been working with DEP and also the commission, and we've uh, put together a notice of intent to address the commission's concerns uh, with the regarding the impacts to the bordering vegetative wetland resource area. Uh, essentially, what we are proposing to do is to remove um, the piles of uh, construction debris, asphalt, brick, concrete, basically mixed with loam. Um, that's these uh, contoured areas you see here. Uh, we're gonna take those out, process them. Um, we do have a, an agreement and permit with DEP on how to proceed with that. That just came in um, the end of last week, the beginning of this week. Um, so we will be following there. Um, consent agreement to uh, address that. We're proposing to regrade the property uh, both beyond the buffer zone and within the buffer zone. The regrading of the property within the buffer zone includes removing all um, fill within the 25 foot no disturb zone. We're going to be bringing that back to existing grade. That area in darker green is approximately 12,200 square feet. We're also proposing to regrade the 100 foot buffer zone um, as shown here. Um, and that's approximately 43, well, it's 43,000 square feet, approximately an acre. Um, these highlighted areas are to be restored um, and they, are to follow South River Environmental's uh, restoration report, which was submitted with the notice of intent. Uh, it follows the you know, standard protocols for restoration, uh, DEP protocols for restoration, uh, planting, monitoring, um, et cetera. If John hops on, I'll let him discuss that a little more length, and I'm happy to answer questions regarding that when, uh, when I'm uh, done reviewing the plans with you. Um, so that's the proposed work within the 100 foot buffer zone. Um, at the request of the commission's agent, we've also prepared stormwater um, design to attenuate runoff from the overall site heading to the resource area. We're proposing to install sediment four bays, um, which are basically swales. You can see the contour here, any water that runs across the site is gonna get caught in this swale and be routed around to an infiltration basin here. There's another swale located at this side. So any stormwater runoff is going to be uh, captured by the swale. Um, there's check dams along the swale to, um, to grab any silt or sediment. Uh, to keep it from going into the infiltration basin, which will allow the infiltration basin uh, infiltrative capacity. Um, so these are pre-treatment devices here. Um, the infiltration basin, as you can see, it's long and narrow. We've done the calculations that show that the rate of runoff from the various storms, the two-year storm through the 100-year storm, 
Uh, it's attenuated, basically, we're not gonna increase the rate of runoff uh, to the resource area in the uh, post-development condition. We've analyzed this entire site as um, gravel, compacted gravel. Um, so it's, it's attenuating a, a lot of runoff um, so that the, uh, the basin is uh, a good, that's why it's such a large basin. Um, so at various storms, the runoff will reach an outlet control structure. There's a series of weirs within that outlet control structure. Uh, and then it's outletted to an erosion control pad, energy dissipator, uh, basically a, a, a riprap stone uh, pad that will disperse the energy of the water and the water that's run through the BMPs and infiltration basin in the larger storms will be reintroduced uh, to the resource area here. Any other water will be infiltrated uh, into, into the ground and introduced back to the water table, groundwater, and resource area uh, by infiltration. Mm -hmm. We've prepared a uh, erosion control plan and construction sequence. Um, basically, the, the red, these red lines are swales. The dashed red lines are construction period uh, sediment traps, basically ponds. So while the work's going on, it tends to get muddy, et cetera. So that water will uh, flow into these sediment traps and they will be outletted through weirs and check dams and controlled so that we don't have a, you know, uh, any mud or silt, siltation of the resource area during construction. Um, let's see, can, can you excuse me for one second? Of course. I'm at my office and the cleaners come on Wednesday nights. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, let's see. So, and then the site is the, at the toe up slope. We're proposing silt sock around the perimeter, the down slope side. Um, on the higher areas outside the buffer zone, we're proposing silt fence. So any any runoff or siltation will be um, mitigated or collected by that uh, silt sock or sediment control. Uh, what I'm proposing to do uh, to to construct this is to actually leave the fill and in the 25 foot buffer zone to begin with. Right now, the vegetation is starting to stabilize this. I think if we leave that in place and do the majority of the the heavy heavy grading, this will add an additional uh, mitigating measure. Any, any re runoff um, will be held back uh, by this uh, um, vegetated uh, buffer zone. So I'd like to do, what we'd like to do is the heavy lifting, moving a lot of material. Um, if we leave this intact, it gives us a stabilized 25 foot setback. So I'd like to do that and then come back and take out the toe of the slope after we get some stabilization of this portion so that we can protect the resource area. Um, that is discussed in the uh, construction sequence. I believe at one of our previous meetings, the commission asked for some cross sections of, of the um, slopes. Um, I, I think I did five or six of these. Uh, it's probably hard to see without multiple sets of plans, what multiple sheets. Um, but basically they're labeled uh, section, they have the section numbers and there's a line that goes through it so that you can see the dashed lines of what's existing today. Some of them are through the uh, ABC piles and the proposed in the dark line is the proposed line. Um, you can see that there's a little swale here above. This would be the infiltration basin. And there's another large swale, another large berm here before it goes down to the 25 foot restoration area. So you can see that we're bringing the grade back down 
to the wetland elevation here. Um, all of these show a similar um, cross section. So water will go into here. It, it cannot jump over this berm mm -hmm. um, unattenuated. So that's, that's that was the purpose of that sheet. Um, we've got some details here. This is probably more of a technical sheet, uh, post development, what's contributing to the um, runoff of that base to that basin, pre development, what's what's contributing today. Um, and I think that's all for now. Um, if John Zimmer's on board, he can discuss the, the restoration plan, but otherwise I'll just take take questions. So you'll be reducing the, the height of the berm by over 30 feet? Is that what in, I saw? In, yeah, in some areas, yep. Um, I believe that would probably be in some of these hill areas. Mm -hmm. If this lower area here is, that's 128, we'll be bringing, bringing that down to 126. So that's not a, a lot, that's only two feet in that, that area. Then we'll carve a basin in down to 118, which is about six feet over existing grade here, which is the resource area. Mm -hmm. We don't wanna carve down to 112, then you're creating an up, you're increasing the wetland, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And once all of this grading is done, what will this whole area be used for? Um, I'm not sure. Basically, it's going to be a regraded, uh, naturalized um, area for now. There isn't any uh, proposed uh, use for it at the moment. The, the use that was there was basically put out of business by the town and can no longer function there. So it's a vacant lot for all intents and purposes. What is the vegetation that will be um, used to um, be planting uh, after it's been regraded? Um, bear with me for a sec. This one wasn't my... Uh, So basically, I, I believe what John Zimmer did was took a pallet of the of the um, plants in the buffer zone, and he is proposing uh, planting those natives within the the buffer zone. So here's a list of the plants that will be put within the 25 and the 100 foot buffer zone. This is the plant the uh, plant list, and then just above this was the seed mix. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, and just uh, another question. So oh. the the purpose of this property has not been determined yet, just to regrade it, and then there's no future plans for this property? Correct. Um, and actually, Megan John said he's on now if you see him. Um, if you please let him in. And you said John was the restoration? Yes, he's okay. the wetland scientist who uh, prepared the restoration plan. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have any specific questions uh, regarding the restoration plan, if he's on, then he can answer those. And I can answer them too, just not as good as him. <laughs> Dr. Shea, were you able to promote him? Yes. Yes, yes he's so a panelist. panelist. So John, the, the last question was regarding what types of plants we're going to be using in the restoration zone. I told him that it's most likely that he took a pallet of the existing plants in the area um, and that basically produced uh, what we're seeing here in front of us. Is that accurate? It, it is to, to some degree the the vegetation that's out there now is a lot of quite a few 
invasives and other kind of opportunistic plants that are that are uh, colonizing the area since it was disturbed. So what I proposed in the planting plan were species that were more on the the facultative to facultative up um, in the in the wetland scale, and that also had a higher wildlife habitat value than some of the plants that were out there now. So the the goal of the restoration plan is to um, number one, you know, kind of get some native plants back in there, and number two, to to improve the ability to of the buffer to function to provide some wildlife habitat. Um, and over time, I'm sure it'll probably get colonized with some of the species that are in the wetland. And as um, Megan and I saw while we were out there, the, the groundwater was pretty high. Uh, there was standing water in the interior of the wetland. Over time, the wetland may you know expand a little bit just based on the, the facultative species that are there. Um, so I think we wanted to allow for that to occur over time if, if possible as well. I believe this wetland has been expanding over time. Anybody who's familiar with the site who's lived in town for a long time is probably familiar that there was a baseball field here. Um, I believe there's some hydraulic issues with the drainage system um, downgrading into this, crossing Howard Street and Claremont. That's created some issues. You know, the commission had uh, probably within the last five or six years allowed for the construction of some houses along uh, Claremont um that would basically it would have been in the way this wetland is now i think this wetland has been hydraulically growing um at the same time that uh, my client's been working at the other side so i think we've had a confluence there mm. would that be exacerbated by the water that would be running off of the area that you're grading um i don't think so uh, the uh what he's what they've been doing here is they've got a berm there that's a significant berm so water's been actually being held back yeah. similar to what we're proposing um the only difference might be from and i don't think this site has been a pristine forest for a long time i think it's basically been a gravel pit over time and a baseball field so i think the difference in the two is not that significant i really believe that the issue here is the downstream hydraulics. I believe the drainage systems are um, getting old or they need to be cleared. And mm. I, I can tell you uh, definitely, um, let's see if I can. Oh, there's, def there's some issues with uh, you know debris being placed near some outlets down here that I saw a few years ago that are probably contributing to it. And I and the drainage system is pretty much overwhelmed here. And I think we're, that it discharges downstream, I think that's also um, in need of some repair. And I really think that's been the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think part of the issue as well is when the site was reworked after it was a baseball field, if they came in and, and removed gravel, a lot of times they'll remove gravel down until they get close to the groundwater table and then they'll back out and just leave it. So I think that was part of part of what happened, at least in the area that's closer to where the fill is now. Right. So the actual uh, presence of actual stormwater, you know, um, efforts will probably help to uh, counteract that, I would expect, right? It, yeah, it'll help. But I, I still think and we've approached the DPW um, regarding clearing some of those, but it's a pretty big endeavor. Um, it's a pretty big site, and there's lots of catch basins and drain pipes to uh, take a look at to address that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shafe? Sure. So I can give an update on where we are in the review. Um, so as part of my wetlands review, as discussed, I was out on the site on December 9th, reviewing the wetland line, looking at current conditions, also reviewing the plans. And so as of the plans that I received ahead of this meeting, um, I have some recommendations uh, for going forward. Uh, first, that as discussed, um, a note should be added to the site plans specifying that all existing fill um, 
shall be removed from the 25 foot buffer zone and the natural contours shall be reestablished in accordance with the buffer zone restoration plan. So if there is going to be some sequencing in terms of where the when the grading happens, um, we want to make sure that's clearly spelled out on the plan so that if the intention is um, not to entirely grade the 25 foot buffer zone first, um, it should be clear that as part of the restoration, ultimately, all the fill will come out of the 25 foot um, at the time of final grading. And then also that um, a note should be added to the plan specifying that all existing fill containing construction debris shall be removed from the 100 foot buffer zone. And so that is a actually a general condition of all orders of conditions. So it's on um, WPA form five, um, general condition C7 uh, states that debris used in a project shall not contain construction debris, including brick, asphalt, masonry, and so on. So we were assuming then as part of a review and an approval of this project that if there is any fill currently on the site in jurisdictional areas with debris in it, it's going to be removed. Um, as part of this project. And similarly, and this ties back into the enforcement order, um, the enforcement order requires soil sampling. And so to carry that over into this notice of intent, I would recommend that a soil testing protocol should be provided for review of any existing fill or material proposed to be re retained within the 100 foot buffer zone. So that is if any of the material currently in the 100 foot buffer zone is going to be proposed to be retained as part of the proposed grading work, then there should be a protocol in place to make sure that in addition to not having debris in it, there's also a testing protocol um, for that soil for standard parameters as you would. Um, look at in cases where you bring an LSP on site, um, any soil or debris, or excuse me, material proposed to remain should be tested otherwise. The more conservative measure would be to remove everything and bring in entirely new clean fill. So that would be the other option in lieu of testing what's out there. Um, and then, in regards to the grading, um, I am recommending that the grading for the proposed berm be pulled back a bit so that the overflow spillway isn't going to be constructed in or at the 25 foot buffer zone. Again, we the commission has the policy of keeping the 25 foot as a no touch except for restoration work. So ideally then there shouldn't be a need for the touch to include either construction of the spillway or again, if we can avoid having the spillway directly into the 25 foot, I think that would be in better keeping with the commission's 25 foot no touch policy. Um, and then also tying back into the enforcement order, um, the enforcement order required a long-term erosion and sedimentation control plan, including seeding and planting plan within the disturbance footprint to prevent future alteration to the wetland resource area and or the 100 foot buffer zone. And so based on that requirement from the enforcement order, I would recommend that the site plan um, show details for stabilization of the entire work area and in this case, the work area, it covers the entire disturbance footprint. Some of that is outside the 100 foot buffer zone. However, it's adjacent to the 100 foot buffer zone. And while um, the enforcement order doesn't require that it be restored necessarily, the commission needs to be sure that it's stabilized um, because if it is adjacent to the 100 foot buffer zone, the commission needs to see that the adjacent area is stable and there won't be erosion issues directly adjacent to the 100 foot buffer zone. So again, 
some whether it's loam and seed or some other some other evidence that the site is going to be stabilized um, as a result of um, this project. And then finally, I just noted um, we've received a couple of revisions um, between when this was first submitted and today. And so I was just asking for a clarification for a couple of minor changes uh, that appear between the plans. For example, one plan set refers to um, an area as an infiltration basin and then on another set, it's not called an infiltration basin. It sounds like it is going to be an infiltration basin, but the terminology should be clear of what drainage structures are going to be out there. And then similarly, um, there's additional infrastructure like a driveway appears on one set, not on another. So again, just being clear going forward, what is being proposed um, in terms of what will be approved as the final site plan. So those are my comments in regards to the wetland review and the review under the enforcement order. And then just to give an update on the stormwater review. So this project is subject to the Mass DEP stormwater management standards. It's also subject to the Brockton stormwater ordinance. Um, so we've been working with Beta Group to put together a scope and fee to do that stormwater review um, because this is a large project. We've been going back and forth, working with the city engineer um, to put together a plan to have beta group review all stormwater issues um, as part of this notice of intent review. So we do have that scope and fee prepared. We've submitted it to the applicant and um, with their go ahead, we'll have beta group um, start on the stormwater review. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions, comments? Not at this time. Um, Ruby? I, yeah, um, I wanted to make sure we get Beta's report on the stormwater review before we make any decisions. Um, I think that'll be critical to us uh, understanding that that piece of it. Um, and then just uh, noting a lot of the proposed items that uh, Megan added in her recommendations. Um, I'd like to see some of that come to fruition as well. Which I suggest would mean continuous to the next meeting. Yeah, we were planning on requesting a continuance since we already have uh, a peer review proposal, et cetera, and they have not had a chance to review it. I think a lot of these, um, well, six items are uh, at least partially addressed, but we don't need to discuss them right now, and I will try to clarify them prior to the next hearing. Okay. Thank you. I entertain a motion to continue to the next meeting. And Madam Chair, would you like to take oh, public comment? Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Of course. Um, is there anyone from the public that has their hand raised? I didn't have my, the attendees up on the screen. I apologize. Yes. Yeah, so I do. Thank I you. see a few hands. And just as an introduction, in addition to those at this meeting, um, the commission has received several comments uh, via email within the past couple hours. Um, we received via email um, from Lisa Crowley, a list of recommended conditions as part of this project. And then we received emails from um, Jamal Brathwaite and Michelle Henson um, in support of the email from Lisa Crowley. All of those emails have been added to the public record. They are in the online file for this project. Um, but as part of this hearing, I just wanted to announce that they are in the public record and they are available to be reviewed ahead of the discussion of um, conditions when the commission reaches that point of the hearing. Okay, thank you and, so much. Yes, and with that, I see uh, Councillor Lally has his hand raised. Thank you, commissioners, can you hear me? Certainly can, thank you. 
All right. Well, as always, I appreciate your time and your diligence on the matter. Um, in the interest of time, I know you got a long agenda. I'll be pretty quick. Uh, I would just, you know, like to say, you know, that I, I would hope that the commission keeps an eye on um, some of the after effects as to whatever happens. Uh, you know, it's all projected now, but what will really happen once the, uh, you know, the, the loam and the gravel are removed. I think that's an important thing to keep an eye on. Uh, I am happy to see, you know, a plan for its removal going forward. I'm glad to, you know, see that progressing. Um, but, uh, you know, beyond everything else, I, I just think there is a need to exercise caution and due diligence. You know, we don't want to uh, you know, rush this along in a way that is going to create a bigger or, you know, greater problem or extend, you know, the difficulty into the future. We want to do it once, we want to do it right. Uh, so I do appreciate your diligence on that. Um, I think it's important that we, you know, finish this off, wrap the, wrap the uh, you know, the errant operation up so we can return to the you know stated and intended purpose of the land as quickly as possible uh you know i i don't want to stretch it out but i do appreciate your time um and i do trust as always the uh judgment of people like our conservation agent i appreciate it thank you mr lally are there any other um attendees Yes, I see Lisa Crowley. Hello, Lisa. Ms. Crowley. Thank you very much for your time and efforts. Um, I just want to reiterate um, that I did submit a, an email with a number of recommendations. They more have to do with the operations um, once Mr. Lucas gets approval, um, keeping an eye on how many trucks that are in and out what work is actually being done. Um, I clearly delineate that in the email. Um, we're worried that he's just gonna start working again um, and crushing and grinding and excavating. He has been doing it. So we just really wanna make sure that he outlines how many trucks, what equipment is necessary and a clear um, timeline as to how this work is going to be done and when it will be done. Um, so I, I really appreciate your efforts in this. I also wanted to clarify some of Kevin Grady's comments. Um, there was no operation up there, no gravel construction company up there over the last 15 years. Um, none of this happened until Mr. Lucas came to town in 2016 with the sports complex proposal. Um, so I did want to clarify that there was a baseball field. There were a couple of houses built on Claremont Ave and around 2008, 2007, somewhere in there. Um, but otherwise, it was a park. It was remove a park. So I just want you to keep that in mind. Um, that was a, it was an open space and it has been destroyed. I'm glad that those 30 feet of um, berm that they call it, those, uh, those piles of debris. So my neighbors on Claremont Ave can actually see the sunrise and sunset again. Um, so I'm glad we're making some progress and um, we will see what happens in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Crowley. Crowley. Are there any other participants, attendees? attendees. That would like to be heard? Yes, I now I see the hand of um, Representative Dubois. Hello, Doc, uh, Ms. Representative Dubois. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy um, to be here with all of you. And I appreciate your diligence and your time and the petitioners information. Um, would it be appropriate if I had questions at this time to ask them? Through the chair. Yo, thank you so much. Okay. Um, is there any way we because I'm not an expert here. Is there any way the petitioner could tell us around how many feet high the pile is at the bottom of Frankton and behind Claremont Ave where the two houses that 
were built in like 2008, those new houses or newer houses are located. How tall the piles are now in their estimation? Because like in my estimation, the one behind Claremont houses is like over a hundred feet tall. And the one over behind uh, at the end of Frankton Ave and, and, um, and the behind um, Douglas are like 75 feet tall, but I, you know, I'm not, a, um, an expert in seeing these, um, I think he called them cross tabs of the mountain, the debris mountain. Like, can he please tell us how tall the pile is at the end of Frankton and Douglas and behind the houses on Claremont? And then how high the pile is going to be when it's all done so we can understand um, what it what it really means to the people living there? Um, Mr. Bois, would, would it be appropriate for him to be able to, or for, for Mr. Grady to address that and bring it to the next meeting? That would be awesome. I would appreciate that. Um, just so people can have an idea because it's been, it's been hard to grasp for, you know, the average person because this has been such a long ordeal and during it, there've been a lot of, you know, inaccurate information. So it would be nice just to have, um, the feeling of security that we're all talking about um, uh, the same thing when we talk about this pile of debris. And Mr. Grady, so I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Mr. Grady, would you have a problem with that? Would you be able to I, get those figures? I can tell you the elevation right now, if, if you'd like. I've got more questions, so I don't know, maybe it would be better to follow up. I don't know how long it will be, but I'm happy to do it whatever way the chair suggests. Well, Mr. Grady, if you'd like to give you those elevations, and we do have sure. a maximum at, at the, amount of time that Ms. Ms. Dubois could speak, but go ahead. Two quick things. Yeah, that, can, but, I, can I just keep going if I have a maximum amount of time? Because there's oh. just a few other things that I wouldn't mind getting more information on. Like, um, I'm wondering um, if it would be appropriate for the commission to ask for an update from the petitioner on the whole DEP order. Um, as a portion of this like reporting in some way and no written or verbal. And then the next one, um, I'm wondering if the if the if there could be a more um, interactive community meeting where there are visual aids for the residents, um, maybe a little less technical about what it looks like now and what it's going to look like when it's over and maybe some questions could be fielded through that, um, like some definition of what the operating hours are and what kind of heavy traffic is going to be in and out going there, and some kind of assurance that the petitioner isn't going to flout the rules, which is what has happened up until now. And Ms. like, Ms. Those Ms. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry to interject, but I, as far as traffic and issues such as that, I believe that would be outside of the purview of the um, Conservation Commission. I believe perhaps a traffic commission or some other department might be able to assist you with that. But doesn't the access road go right over um, part of like the 25 foot buffer area? Doesn't it somehow get impacted with how the trucks are gonna be entering the site to remove the debris? They kind of They kind of go right through the middle of it. Am I wrong there? Dr. Shape, would you like to input? Um, by what is shown, there is no access or traffic proposed that would be entering the wetland. Um, again, in terms of what's been impacted to the 25 foot, there is fill in the 25 foot. And so there would be um, work and construction equipment to remove that fill. But again, as that relates to traffic, that is not under the purview of the Conservation Commission. And then just to touch on the other comments um, involving the elevations and raising and lowering the um, grading. In the meantime, um, anyone who is interested in seeing the plans, they are posted on the Commission Public Drive via our website. Um, the representative and any members of the public are welcome to review those cross sections that were shown to see again the current elevations, the proposed elevations, 
Um, and then in terms of um, a public input meeting, um, under the Wetlands Protection Act, we are currently holding the um, required public hearing, um, and we will continue to hold those hearings. In terms of any sort of neighborhood type meetings, that would have to be an arrangement made between the property owner and the public outside of um, this meeting. But currently, this is a public hearing. The public is welcome to attend and participate. And this is what is required under the Wellness Protection Act is what we are doing here now. Thank you very much. So when um, when I look, I'm looking at the maps, I have them open on my computer. And when I'm looking at one of them, it looks like there's elevation and it looks like Howard Street is shown and it has Franklin Ave. And then further down the road across from Dorenzo um, is where is, is, am I accurate? That's where the, um, the vehicles will come into the site. And if I'm looking at the map right, um, it gets kind of close to the to the buffer. Um, there's some kind of buffer there. I'm, my computer's kind of mixing up here, so it's a very complicated map. I am looking at it, but so 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 you're in agreement that where the construction trucks are going to be entering and exiting is off of Howard Street, um, down by where Dorenzo is. Am I am I understanding that's what the plan is? Through the chair, yes, the plans are proposing the construction entrance for this project to be via Howard Street. Right. And isn't that really close? I mean, when I was looking at the map, I just lost it from my from my screen. I'm sorry. Um, but when I was looking at the map earlier before I lost it, it looked like the trucks that will be coming onto the site are going to like run right along one of the buffer lines there based on the 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 map I have been looking at. And so there is is what kind of protections are going to be put into place with that? Like, is that an issue? Or is that buffer line outside of an area that matters? I've lost the map I was looking at. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so through the chair, um, the proposed construction entrance at Howard Street is not within the 100 bu foot buffer zone. Um, most of this parcel is outside the 100 foot buffer zone. Um, as proposed, they will be accessing the jurisdictional area via Howard Street and then will be entering the 100 foot buffer zone to do the proposed work um, as would be with any project. So yes, they will be accessing the 100 foot buffer zone to do this work and that is what they are seeking a permit to do. Um, but in terms of the statement of the, the access being near the wetland, um, jurisdictionally, no. The driveway and the entrance at Howard Street is not near the wetland. It is well outside the 100-foot buffer zone. Okay, sounds good. Um, did they create a waterway when they, when, they cre when they brought in all this debris? And does that bring in different regulations governing um, this remediation or this project? Um, so through the chair, um, issues of water gathering on and leaving the site is stormwater management. Um, those calculations and design will be reviewed by our peer consultant beta group under the standards established by MassDEP and the city. Um, in terms of the wetland side of it, again, based on the enforcement order, the commission has already acknowledged there have been impacts to jurisdictional areas in terms of the wetland resource area, um, which is why uh, this notice of intent has been filed. Um, but again, in terms of the stormwater issues, um, that will be reviewed as part of this process by our peer consultant. Okay. I would, uh, would there be someone from the city on site when this um, remediation was being done? And are there plans? I, I, I think I heard you talk about um, testing of soil if it's remaining in the 100 foot buffer. Is there any way to require that there be soil testing prior to work being done in that area um, and disturbance of that area to make sure there isn't like asbestos in there or something like that? Uh, through the chair, I think all of those items will be addressed via special conditions. Um, 
At this point, special conditions tend to be discussed um, farther on into the hearing process following the peer review and so on. Um, but certainly everything related to monitoring and testing will be discussed as part of the discussion of special conditions for any permit. And I'm sorry to go on, but I just have a few more um, just so I can understand the process to be able to engage with it. Um, you mentioned uh, the rates of runoff, not that you covered that. And you talked about the, I'm just reading my questions. I'm sorry. Um, I'm just, well, the, the commission also has some emails that have been sent to the public drive. So if you have questions that you'd like to submit to the public drive so that the commission will be able to look at those prior to the next meeting, that would be appreciated. And That's it would what I'll do. Time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I appreciate you. all you're doing. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, and so, where were we? Uh, motion to continue. I think I was going to entertain a motion to continue. Yeah, motion to continue. Second. Okay, so there's been a motion to continue the discussion of map 181042 Claremont Avenue to the January 18th meeting that's been made and seconded. Uh, roll call vote, please. Speak Clay, I. Curtis, I. Boris, I. Gentlemen, we will see you next month. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you. Okay. I do need to take just a one minute break. Is that okay? Stretch break? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Laura, Peggy, Ruby. Everyone has disappeared. I'm back. Hello. I'm just waiting for Laura. Hi, Laura. Thank you. Okay, so the last item of the agenda, actually, yeah, this would be the last item for 2022, um, is the notice of intent for a Black Ledge 40B apartment complex on the Eastern Brockton line. Okay. So at the last meeting of the Brockton Conservation Commission, Mr. Tuhill, a representative of uh, for Blackledge Development Corporation stated um, that at the re uh, applicant's request, uh, he did not want the hearing continued. And so we closed the meeting at that time. Um, so the hearing was closed. And so this evening as a commission, we have to make a decision. Um, on the applicant, on the application. Um, we have to determine, I guess, if we have been provided enough information um, to be able to 
make a determination. And if we have enough information, then perhaps to uh, issue the order conditions. So there, it seems as though there are two options. Either we don't have enough information and therefore we deny, or we have enough information and we can issue order conditions with special conditions listed. That's my understanding. Um, I think we've heard from different, we've heard varying opinions from different well-spoken professionals, um, sometimes in contrast to each other. Bit confusing at times, I think, um, with some of the, the stormwater standards and the seasonal high groundwater and modeling with a T and modeling with a D. And some of it has been a bit confusing, and but we've learned a lot, I think. Um, Beta Group certainly has uh, confirmed and reconfirmed that this project complies with the Massachusetts stormwater standards. Um, and if this were a question of just stormwater, I don't think there would be, I don't think it would be a difficult decision at all. I don't think that, I, I, I'm not sure that it would have dragged on this far, actually. Um, the stormwater infiltration system that's proposed by Blackledge seems adequate. I mean, I, I'm not sure for sure, but it seems that it certainly is an improvement over untreated stormwater that's raining down on a potentially contaminated site and then drizzling into the wetlands in Brockton. So it seems to me that to have an actual stormwater treatment system is actually an improvement. Um, but the discussion of that seasonal groundwater and all of those different discussions that we were having, for me, is cluttered by the fact that, um, that there are going to be thousands of gallons of water that will be coming out of the Easton um, water supply, and that will be piped up to that complex. And then we'll, from that water department, are going to go through 104 apartments um, with 178 bedrooms and trickle out through bathrooms and uh, kitchens and laundry areas, and then go to sewage treatment with on the site. And then that water eventually is going to be going to some kind of a holding tank that will um, eventually seep into the ground for clarification and for recharge. Um, I'm not sure that was the exact words, but that's the way I understand it. Um, so I just, I'm just a bit concerned that the seasonal high ground groundwater discussions and all of that, um, have they really taken account of that additional water that will be added to that system and what, because that system seems like a large part of it is actually going to be is actually going to be sequestered up against the Brockton border, uh, the Eastern Brockton line there. Um, and what will be the ultimate outcome of having that water um, every day, you know, thousands of gallons every day, you know, every day, every month for years to be sitting there and gradually seeping into that area. And if our charge is to protect wetlands, and we are the Brockton Conservation Commission. Um, I really don't want to miss an opportunity to make sure that the Brockton wetlands are are, are not um, damaged in some way or changed in a way that you know would could be avoided. Um, that's just my own personal opinion. Um, it doesn't seem as though we've had a strong ruling from anyone uh, that said that, oh, we, you know, Brockton wetlands will be okay. I've certainly heard that, yeah, they will be wetter, um, but at, to what degree will that affect um, the environment, the ecosystems there? I, I'm not really sure. Um, I think our job tonight is to determine if there's enough information to make a ruling. Um, and 
Dr. Shave, I don't know if you have anything that you would like to share or commissioners, if you have anything that you would like to share. I certainly don't mean to just take up just my time, but I'd love to hear what else you have, anything that you might have to say. I hope um, I I too have concerns about the uh, back and forth on the groundwater, um, the difference between four inches, six feet, like there just been so many different numbers kind of put out there. Um, it's just really tough to determine what, how to address it with all these different um, numbers being uh, thrown at us about it and thoroughly went over Beta's um, comments and summaries. And I don't know, it's just so, it's so many different numbers to, I guess that concerns me because again, nobody can really be definitive on the difference between four feet, six feet, six inches, three. It, you kind of just don't know what, I don't know how to, I'm struggling with this, honestly. Megan, what is um, your opinion on the overall daily usage of water and how it would affect our wetlands? What is your professional opinion? Um, so based on the information that has been provided to the commission, I have not seen evidence of negative impacts to the wetland resource areas. As part of that review, we are concerned about the stormwater management system um, because it is designed to meet the Mass DEP stormwater management standards and, so, and those standards include treatment and being able to recharge um, the required storm, so up to the 100 year storm. And all of that is indeed contingent um, upon assumptions and measurements made um, as part of the design process. But when it comes to the engineering side of it and determining if it meets the mass DEP management standards, um, as I've stated, I do defer to Beta Group as the commission's consultant on stormwater engineering. Again, they reviewed the project and all the information received on behalf of the commission. And as of their um, November 8th letter, they did reconfirm that the design meets the Mass DEP stormwater management standards. They did add that comment, comment one, that if the commission wanted to account for the predicted mounding beneath the infiltration system due to the wastewater treatment system um, in order to maintain the proposed six feet of separation as previously assumed to be the case, Beta does recommend that the bottom of the infiltration system could be raised 0.6 feet. So again, in terms of what our peer reviewer determined is that it does meet the stormwater management standards. If the commission wants to account for that additional groundwater mounding due to the wastewater treatment um, system, uh, it could be, the system could be raised that 0.6 feet. Additionally, and that would be to maintain the six feet of separation from groundwater proposed. Um, again, based on the design assumption that without doing a separate mound analysis, they're required to have a separation of four feet. So they were already proposing six feet. And then again, assuming there is mounding from the wastewater treatment plant, that water um, leaching out, Beta recommends they could raise it another 0.6 feet as a conservative measure. Um, so again, based on that, I defer to Beta as our engineers that it meets the stormwater management standards in terms of wetland impacts. Um, I know we've been reviewing this for a while. Um, 
but over all of the changes we went through, we made sure the limit of work is outside the 25 foot buffer zone. Um, we did ask for supplementary plantings um, in the 25 foot buffer zone, which they have provided. Um, so in terms of um, everything the commission asked for and everything I asked for, um, we have seen those changes. Um, so going forward again, as um, the chair has pointed out, there are essentially two decisions you could motion on and vote on. Um, one would be to issue an order of conditions with any special conditions the commission feels necessary um, to ensure um, the protection of the resource areas, or the motion could be made to deny due to lack of information. And then should that motion be made and voted on, um, the commission should also note that as part of that ruling, there needs to be a description of what information is lacking. So if that is the motion the commission is going to consider and vote on, then there would also need to ideally be, I would recommend, a discussion and vote on what is the missing information that has prevented the commission from issuing the order of conditions. So it's the two point one, about those are the two um, paths of motions to be made. I have another question for you in your professional opinion. If say we approve uh, this notice of intent and in along the line, there is flooding in the area to the residents of Brockton what is our recourse at that point if the the measures that have been put in place and approved by Bader and DEP and it's still not enough we need to be able to protect the residents of Brockton and the wetland area um, what further recourse would we have to request the owners to do so recourse for the commission is through enforcement and in order to issue an enforcement order, there would need to be um, demonstrated impacts by the applicant to the resource area and it would need to be not in compliance with an order of conditions. And so again, it would be tricky to it, if the project is built as designed, it is very difficult, again, not only to enforce um, downstream, because it would be presumably downstream impacts, but also it, it would be difficult to attribute um, those impacts to the project. Um, because we have to look long term and again, if you compare things how they are now to years ago and with climate change, we are going to see more precipitation. Um, we are going to see more flooding at sites and areas that didn't flood, even if nothing changes. So again, I, I can't give a straight answer on our recourse that if there is flooding in Brockton in the future, the, the truth is there's going to be flooding in Brockton in the future. Even if we stopped all work and we did nothing going forward, um, as climate change progresses, we're going to continue to see heavier storms, flash storms that overwhelm our existing infrastructure because a lot of times flooding, it's an infrastructure issue. Brockton's drainage is old. It is not staffed to be maintained. Sometimes it's a matter of if a catch basin is blocked, then you can see flooding. So it's, again, I can't give a straight answer, but enforcement, as you've seen, it's um, the commission issues enforcement orders when work has done that impacts a jurisdictional area that has not been approved. And so going forward, we would be um, doing enforcement for unapproved work in jurisdictional areas. So if a plan as proposed 
seem to meet the letter of the law, but the plan was not adequate for some reason, there really is no recourse per se because the plan was followed. Is that correct? Uh, ultimately, yes, by my understanding, if the plan is met, then the plan again, as designed in the regulations, it gets into the question, are the regulations adequate? Right. And that is a much bigger um, question than we can tackle here. Right. Um, certainly there's a case to be made, not only the stormwater management standards, the Wetlands Protection Act arguably does not go as far as it needs to, especially in the face of climate change. Mm -hmm. But that is not, it's way beyond the our commission is going to be able to yeah. address. Yeah. In so my unprofessional opinion, because <laughs> <laughs> I am by no means a professional, but um, right now as it stands, it's just the land itself, the water, when it rains, it just floods into that wetlands area. If something is built on there, then there's some kind of um, plan for overflow and stormwater and storage. So, I mean, I, I know at this point I have to abstain from voting, but in my opinion, something being built on there with some kind of um, the infrastructure would be better than nothing at all. I believe that's why there are stormwater standards, right? Yeah, yeah. So another option then would be if we issue an order conditions to add other conditions perhaps that might um, allow us to maybe monitor or to see maybe to help to conserve that area as much as possible. Um, for example, adding the um, recommendation by beta of yeah. rising the depth of the infiltration mm -hmm. basin. Um, you mean like not being able to grandfather anything in so that if there's any DPA updates and standards, then they would have to comply? Meaning? Or is that? Uh, that's not what I had in mind. Oh, but... OK. Sorry. So my thought process is adding the additional comments from beta as special conditions. You mean to that, increase to raise the elevation of that a, a correct yep. system yeah. by yep. the point six feet? Yeah. That could be added as a condition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um Laura, do you have any add I'm sorry. If I could add, Madam Chair, I think Peggy was touching on the other Mass DEP permit. And if you'll recall, it was my, probably my last report, I think my October report. I also had some recommended special conditions, and one of them included um, receiving confirmation of approval of the wastewater permit. Um, so again, I would still recommend all of the conditions from my report be included, but again, certainly um, the condition, the commission can motion to include any conditions that they feel necessary. Actually, um, commissioners, do you have um, Dr. Shaves October 11th? That was her last um, list of conditions. Perhaps we could quickly look at that, make sure we understand all of that, see if there's anything else that sh that we could add and then determine whether or not it's a yes vote or a no vote based on that. Dr. Tate, did you want to go through that at all or do you feel Yes, I can okay. refresh. So again, these are in addition to our standard special conditions. Um, I would recommend special conditions first that all remaining surface concrete products and surface man-made objects placed in the Brockton Audubon Preserve shall be removed prior to the pre-construction meeting and start of new work, as well as commission approval of any building permits. Wildlands Trust shall be notified at least five business days ahead of the removal activities. Uh, next, the 
hydrological evaluation and all approval documents associated with the Mass DEP wastewater permit application shall be submitted electronically to the commission prior to the pre-construction meeting and start of new work. Yeah, I, and, hmm? I, I just had a very quick question about that one. Does the Mass DEP take a look at the interaction between wastewater and and stormwater or? I'm not, ex I'm not sure exactly what their um, permit reviews. It is entirely within the state. It is, um, there's no city component okay. to that permit. Which, but that basically says that, that Black Village would have to have an approved wastewater treatment system before the, the project could go forward. Is that correct? A DEP approved system? Yes, and we would want to see evidence of all okay. documents. And also that ties into, again, the idea being that if the project changes between the commission's approval and the start of work, um, they would need to come back for an amended order anyways. So even if the project changed as a result of the fact that Eastern Conservation Commission is not complete yet. So if, if the Eastern Conservation Commission finds something that results in an alteration of the plan, then those that change of plans has to be, we yes. have to be made cognizant of that change of plans. Yes, and, assuming again, except in the cases of minor changes, which as you know, are things of replacing one species of tree to something yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But if it's anything more substantial than that, as you know, they come back with the revised plan and the request for an amended order of conditions. So that would be necessary okay. um, in a case where there are multiple permits involved. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then for the monitoring, um, we've received a draft of the SWIP, but I'm recommending that we get the completed and signed SWIP um, prior to the pre-construction meeting and start of new work, and that prior to the pre-construction meeting and start of new work, the commission shall receive the name and contact information of the person identified through the SWIP to be responsible for monitoring the erosion and sedimentation controls and the limit of work throughout the construction process. And then following that, copies of all monitoring reports and inspection forms required through the SWIP um, pertaining to earth moving or construction activities within the 100 foot buffer zone shall be submitted to the commission. And then as an ongoing condition, um, that no snow shall be pushed over or past the edge of the designated snow storage area in Brockton. Okay. So again, those are my recommended conditions, but the commission um, can recommend any conditions as part of their motion. Well, my understanding is that that entire stormwater system has to be maintained in a long-term, you know, has long-term maintenance and operation procedures that have to be that have to be um, followed. Is that correct? Yes. So, as part of the stormwater report, there is an operation and maintenance plan, and in the operation and maintenance plan, there's a checklist of the um, different maintenance tasks. There's quarterly tasks. There's annual tasks, and then there were also um, example inspection logs in that O and M plan that's within the stormwater report. Do you think that it would be beneficial for, um, for, for the commission to get a copy of perhaps a quarterly report and the annual report, just to make sure that we can keep an eye on the logs and the integrity of the system as time moves forward, um, at, at, just on a long-term basis, as not, not just during the construction phase, but on a long-term basis to be able to, since it is actually on Brockton land and going to be going into the Brockton resource areas, if we would be able to get copies of those reports? I mean, I think that would be an appropriate continuing condition because it's already in the operations and maintenance plan 
that they will be doing quarterly and annual maintenance. And there's already example log inspections, inspection logs in the operation and maintenance plan. So the assumption is that the maintenance will be done and those logs will be filled out. So I wouldn't expect it would be um, cumbersome for the commission to receive copies of those logs. Commissioners, what do you think? At least you will see what the condition of the actual yeah. stormwater um, yeah, I agree. like over long term. And maybe that would that might, you know, at least it would be available to the commission for evaluation on an ongoing basis. Um, if, I, if I agree. Reasonable. Yeah, I agree as well. Um, I agree to uh, the items that Megan lists um, for her recommendations, as well as what Beta has listed to all be a part of special condition. Okay. And then, and then that perhaps that monitoring report. Um, let's see what else. Oh, I know at one time there was a discussion about uh, about fencing and about uh, a, a gate, and I. I I thought Mr. Tuathel had mentioned that he thought it would be okay to um, um, to to have a non-locking gate, perhaps that was uh, at the top of the stairs. Perhaps that could be. I mean, it is conservation. I know that that's not wetlands, but it is conservation in nature to make sure that there is no dumping, or uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily a locked gate as long as it's um, as long as it's there to make sure that it's posted for no dumping. And then also, I believe I had asked at one point to see if there was some some way to prevent litter from, you know, since it's going to be fenced anyway, some way to prevent litter from uh, blowing into the into that conservation area. Um, it is a fairly dense place with lots of people, lots of cars. I don't know if that's an option to request that as a special condition or not. Um, right, so I can say I know we discussed um, the gate and had requested the gate. I believe the final answer from the applicant was that due to maintenance and public safety concerns, they were not going to propose the gate. And so the plan we have before us does not show a gate. It shows um, the signage specifying that it's for emergency use. Um, so in terms of, again, technically the commission can add whatever special conditions they want, um, but again, they sh the conditions should be necessary for the protection and of the wetland resource areas. So again, I would suggest that the commission, again, consider what conditions are necessary um, for the protection of the resource areas and the interests under the act. I know we, the commission has a dual role in the sense that they also have a stake in conservation land in general, but again, we want to consider the jurisdiction for our special conditions. Okay. Uh, what about limiting pet waste? Would that potentially um, at least the area uh, along that Brocken area about limiting pet waste there be because of the possibility of it infiltrating into um, into the wetlands area and actually changing the biology of the area. Um, I, my recommendation for that would be again, if it's a special condition, the commission should think about specifically what it would be. Um, because it needs to be specific enough to be implemented and to be um, easily understood and upheld. So offhand, I'm not sure exactly what that condition um, would be, but again, I would recommend the commission be very specific. I think as, because it's a 40B project anyway, that has to be can taken into consideration for mass DEP for pets and any other property that has had that, that's that's inclusive to that whole process. So I don't know if a special condition would be needed because it's a 40B project and if it's going to have to follow certain guidelines anyway in regards to that. Okay. I don't know enough of, about the pet waste piece, but I just 
I want to make sure that things aren't going to be concentrated in one area and then potentially uh, go into our resource area as a result. Um, it just seems like the wetlands is so interconnected, you know, that um, we can't just look at this small piece of resource area since everything does is pretty much connected. Um, So Joyce, for me, mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with issuing the order of condition as long as what Megan has listed as her recommendations and the, re the recommendations of beta are included in the special conditions. And would you be okay with having long-term monitoring, like the, the Ab long-term yes. monitoring yep. reports? Also? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because mm -hmm. again, like you know, like she spoke of, you know, climate change, all different things will factor in over time, anyway. So I think the best um, information that we can get from a long-term perspective would be a move in the right direction. And then because the piece that we're approving. I'm not going to say it's minimal, it's a small impact. It's an impact, nonetheless. But again, the project could still change, like she said. So mm -hmm. even though we're doing the piece that we've reviewed with the conditions and the special conditions we're adding, I think those address the, the major concerns that we have. And then if something comes out of other components and or pieces or changes due to what Easton has to do for their side, I think that at some point, everything that we're concerned about will, will be addressed in the most appropriate way. And Megan, is there, is there anything in your conditions? I'm just checking really quickly. I, I'm really getting tired. Um, if about, pro, if there's a change in the project um, that the request for amended conditions would would be made, is that automatically assumed that it would happen? It's automatically assumed. So I don't, I don't think it hurts to include it as a special condition, but I don't think you need to. It is. Well, only because there are two, two commissions involved and the Eastern Commission isn't, com you know, isn't completely finished with their, pro with their uh, approval. Right. But again, as we've discussed, um technically if they technically if they changed anything even if they were to say swap a red maple for something <laughs> else technically they're supposed to tell us and we determine if it's a minor change or not because it could be that if they change something and don't request an amended order then they couldn't get their certificate of compliance ultimately the commission could decide if they change something and don't request an amended order then they could ultimately not get their certificate of compliance if they change it. So there it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's understood okay. that okay. any change, any change really should be brought to the commission, but you know, it's understood that any design change is going to need a request for an amended order because if they don't build it as approved, they could be looking at an enforcement order. They could be looking at not getting their certificate of compliance and obviously you know, you don't want enforcement order. You don't want the city of Brockton taking them to court. Mm -hmm. over and, design and you'll team. be monitoring this throughout the process, I assume. Yes, it would be also, again, as I'm recommending through the SWIP, the SWIP mm -hmm. has more stringent monitoring protocols anyway. So similarly, we're asking to be kept in the loop um, with the monitoring that's going to be done under that process. Okay, which means we can have one of two ways to go. Either we vote no due to insufficient information because of the maybe, or we go with the order of conditions with those additional conditions that we have added. So for me, I don't mind 
issuing the order of condition as long as our special conditions that Megan has outlined and what beta is outlined since they are our who we have to rely on. I think as long as that's inclusive, I don't have a problem with issuing the order of condition. Um, I think it makes sense with all the different things that are going on. And then like Megan said, depending on whatever happens with Easton and whatever, if a change happens, then we know we would be looking for an, an amended order based on whatever this new change and or uh, process would be. And then we are going to have our conditions met based on what we have asked outlined and what we're saying. So I, with that, I'm conf I feel a little bit more confident about the process. I would agree with Ruby. I'm not sure exactly what Brockton is getting out of this, but <laughs> I'm sorry, Ruby, did you say something? I said, I'm not sure much either, but I mean, for us it's, to, That's what makes it very difficult. It's- Yeah, yeah. I think because it's because it encroaches, the building of this development encroaches on our city property, correct? Is that my understanding? Okay, so- Yeah, and, I, I, and, the, the, drainage the, and the drainage will, from that- And the drainage from that. Will eventually right. end up in Brockton, right. a lot of it, right. some of it, yeah. Right. Yeah, and will that alter our habitat that's there now? But yeah. as Megan said, that that would be changing anyway. I mean, it's all, it, nothing is, is, you know, constant. But. Right. So I leave it up to you. I know, Peggy, you have to abstain. So Ruby or Laura, entertain a motion from either. I just want to know Laura's thought process. I was here six weeks ago. My opinion is to approve it. I have nothing to add. So would you entertain a motion then? Yeah, I can do it. Yeah, uh, it's all right to trust. I make a motion to issue uh, an order of conditions with special conditions outlined this evening along with the outlined pre-existing agents report for map 003-049 Pleasant Street, otherwise known as Black Ridge LLC. And I second the motion. The motion has been made and seconded for clarification, the extra conditions that we would like to add to the agents list would be number one, we would like to see Beta's uh, recommendation for increasing the um, height of the, um, Megan, if you could help me with the word wording. Um, uh, it's the point 0.6 raising the infiltration six. six to raising the base six. Right. But yes, in reference to Beta's comment number one. Okay, but that would that would be one. The second one would that we would be getting copies of the long term monitoring of the of that infiltration system that that those copies would be made available to the commission for for review. And what was was there another one? Um, hold on, that was another one. Yeah, I think that what um, Megan said about the SWIP and she had a list of different, all, all the items that she listed mm -hmm. in her report. Okay, so Madam Chair, it sounds like we're looking to confirm the motion to issue an order of conditions with the special conditions outlined in my report, the recommendation from comment one of Beta's report, and the request to receive copies of the inspection logs 
um, from the quarterly and annual monitoring under the operation and maintenance plan. Mm -hmm. so let me just check my notes. I thought there was one more. Raising the elevation. No, I think that's it. Yeah, I think that seems, I think that was, that was, that was it. So I, so the motion has been made and seconded then. Roll call vote, please. Was it seconded, Madam Chair? Oh, was it? Yes, I seconded. I thought so. Okay, yeah. just check. Aye. Clay I. Curtis abstained. Mm -hmm. Boris I. Motion is made and passed with Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Okay. Are we adjourned? See you next year. A vote to adjourn. Second. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.